Hi, everybody. Anne Louise Gittleman here, your hostess with the First Lady of Nutrition podcast. And today we have the doctor's doctor with us, Dr. Lee Cowden, who has been considered a pioneer in the alternative integrative medicine field. And he's pioneered many successful treatments for which he's known worldwide. And these include alternative treatments for cancer, for Lyme disease, for cardiomyopathy, neurological conditions, and silicone implant disease. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you. How are you today, Dr. Cowden? I'm doing very well. I'm uh, optimistic today. Optimism is where it's at, Dr. Cowden. Now, I know you because you have also been my own doctor, and you are so far ahead of the others that it is that is, you're leaving everybody in the dust. And I know we're going to be talking about the future of uh, energy medicine. But for now, do you mind terribly if I ask you a little bit about silicone implant disease? Because I'm hearing more and more about this from women that have had their silicone implants explanted. What does one do, for example, if one has had silicone breast implants and is now sick? Well, yeah, uh, the, the very first step usually is to get the uh, implants removed because as long as they're in, you can't really get the microscopic silicone out of the body. Uh, and, you know, that that takes a, a fairly major decision. And, you know, the surgery is not without compli potential complications and risk. But I think it's uh, worth every bit of it. You know, uh, you know, if you have to choose between whether you have a big chest or whether you have good health, I think most people uh, ultimately would choose good health. <laughs> I and, agree. And, and so, uh, you know, w when a person has implants in, uh, they are getting you know, microscopic pieces of silicone released into their system continuously. If it's a silicone implant, it's, it's large amounts of silicone coming out of the implant daily. If it's a, it's a saline implant with silicone shell, then it's lesser amounts, but it's still not insignificant. And the other problem with the saline implants is they almost always become filled with uh, funguses and, and the funguses start producing biotoxins, mycotoxins that poison the system. So either way, the implants are poisonous to the, to the woman. And uh, anyway, I have to get all the, all the uh, implants removed surgically to the best of the ability, not just, not just taking the implant out, but also taking the capsule out around the implant where a lot of the silicone, microscopic silicone is located. Then it's possible to get the silicone out of, out of the body with a, a cleanse that I developed uh, back in 1990. I had a Hollywood movie star uh, call me and say, uh, Dr. Cowden, I've been referred by a friend. The friend said that if anybody in the country could help me, it would be you. That's I said, true. What, what is, <laughs> I said, what is your problem? She said, well, I have silicone implant disease, and I had the silicone implants removed, but I'm still gravely ill. I'm an actress, and I, I can't remember my acting lines. lines. I'm 100% disabled. I have profound fatigue, uh, achiness of all my muscles and all my joints, and I'm just in bad shape. I said, well, come to Dallas, and we'll uh, see if we can figure it out. So she came to Dallas, and I spent uh, a couple of hours with her the first visit to figure out what was going to be needed, and it was a very extensive program. Uh, she had to go on to a fast for at least five days, preferably seven, a modified fast with vegetable juices but no other calorie intake, and she had to go on to uh, fiber and clay orally. She had to go on a variety of supplemental nutrients orally, some, some lymphatic therapy daily, uh, some ozonated colemas, uh, you know, basically ozonating four gallons of water and running into the rectum over about 45 minutes twice a day, and to do some ozonated baths and some body soap baths and, uh, you know, some emotional work and so on. So uh, she couldn't remember how to do what we asked her to do, so I had to send my very best nurse to her hotel to hold her hand for two hours twice a day to get her through the first few days. Finally, by about the fifth day, she was able to remember what she was supposed to do, and my, my nurse just went over there to watch her do what she was doing and verify that she was able to do what she was supposed to do. And she had quite a bit of improvement just in that week. We sent her home with all the equipment, all the supplements, and said, keep doing this uh, you know, seven days out of every, uh, every month or even seven days out of every 21 days, and uh, let us know how you do. So she called us about six months later, and she said, I'm completely well. Uh, I, I can remember all of my acting lines I have no more, more muscle aches or joint aches or any of the symptoms that I had when I came to you. And uh, that was 29 years ago now or 30 years ago. So she's, she's uh, still cranking them out. <laughs> 
So the question is for those of my listeners that have this very same issue, how can they get your protocol? Where would they go? Well, I've only trained a, a handful of people in the country, unfortunately, so far, but I'm willing to train others if, uh, if I have somebody that's really serious on, on learning how to do it. But it's a very intense program. It's not, it's not for everybody to try to do. I've taught a, uh, a, a registered nurse in Waco, Texas, uh, Tammy Hughes, how to do that. I've taught a, uh, a, a naturopathic doctor out in, uh, uh, I guess that was... Uh, North, north of LA, I forget what the town is up there, uh, how to do it. I've taught, I've taught a couple of other uh, nurses uh, in different places. There's a, uh, a chiropractor up in uh, Union, Missouri that does it. Uh, doc, uh, there's a naturopath, uh, certified natu- traditional naturopath in uh, Prescott, Arizona that does it. So that there's only a few in the country that are doing it, but uh, you know, if they can get uh, hooked up with one of those people, then they can go through that first week uh, and learn how to do it. It is such an intense and, and complicated cleanse that most people can't read a piece of paper and learn, and figure out how to do it. It's too, there's too much to it. So they go to somebody and spend a week with them and, and, and go through it and learn how to do it and to do it right. And then they can take the equipment home and finish, finish the cleansing process. I had one patient who had uh, an entire silicone implant rupture and she had more than a cup of silicone scattered throughout her body. Mm-hmm. She had uh, six primary cancers and unstable angina pectoris and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue and multiple sclerosis all at the same time. And it took her more than a year of you know a week on and two weeks off cleansing to get all that silicone out. But she finally did, and she's you know still alive and well today. Uh, you know, 25 years later. Thank God. So if people needed more information, they could contact one of your staff members at info at acimconnect.com. Is that the best bet? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that would work. I love that. So thank you for that. Now I have to ask you about Lyme disease and mold. I know you've pioneered many successful treatments, but what should we know about Lyme disease? Well, Lyme disease is is probably the the most... uh, uh, rapidly expanding epidemic epidemic worldwide. You know, we, we're all concerned about the coronavirus right now, but uh, Lyme disease is uh, ultimately probably more, uh, causes more fatalities uh, worldwide than the coronavirus is. And uh, Lyme disease, uh, you know, for example, it, it's estimated that at least 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease every year in the United States. That's not, you know, total. That's every year, 300,000 new ones. And a large percentage of the people die from, from uh, you know, immune suppression. The Borrelia and the Bartonella both produce immune suppressive substances and predisposed to other infections that finally knock the person off. Or they develop cancer because their immune system's down. Or they develop suicide because, because they become so hopeless and despondent. And so it takes a lot of lives every year. And, you know, Lyme disease, uh, once it's <clears throat> in, the, in, the, <clears throat> in the acute phase, is not uh, usually that difficult to get rid of if you if you catch it you know when the patient has, walks in with a bullseye rash uh, and start them immediately on doxycycline that clears a lot of them in in just a you know, couple of weeks time. However, most patients don't get diagnosed uh, in that first couple of weeks, and then they come into the doctor's office months or years later, and the doctor finally figures out that they had Borrelia and co-infections all that time. And at that point, the antibiotics don't work. You know, there's dozens of articles in the peer-reviewed literature that show the antibiotics don't work for chronic Lyme disease. And uh, so the patients typically just go from doctor to doctor suffering because no, no, none of the doctors know how to go about dealing with chronic Lyme disease. One of the doctors that was dealing with chronic Lyme disease uh, was Dr. Richard Horowitz. And he called me in uh, 2006, uh, no, sorry, 2002, uh, and he's, no, it was 2006, sorry, 2006. And he said, uh, I have 10,000 Lyme patients in my practice and 500 of them are doing very poorly, even though I've done everything I know to do with antibiotics. And uh, he said, do you have any ideas? I said, yes, I do. I can uh, give you a, a empiric protocol that you can put the patients on. There's no, no pharmaceutical drugs in it, but uh, the patients are typically doing really well when they do that. So he put a couple of hundred patients on the program, and at the end of six months, 70% were really well. And so he uh, was really excited about that, presented that at the International Lyme Associated Disease Conference that year. 
uh, and told me he was really happy with the 70% improvement. I said, so well, that is good for the 70%, but it's not very good for the 30%. What are you going to do about them? He said, I don't know. What do you think we should do about them? So I said, well, if you'll gather some of them together, I'll come to your office and we can evaluate them energetically and see if we can figure out what's going on. So he did that, and I evaluated about a dozen patients one day at his office, and we found that most of those that were still ill were not drinking any water at all. They were drinking soda and coffee as hydration. Mm-hmm. They they were eating gobs of sugar. They were uh, they, most of them had a mouthful of mercury amalgams. Most of them were living in a mold infested environment or working in a mold infested environment. Uh, you know, so there was a lot of things that that had nothing to do with Lyme disease or the protocol uh, that that was keeping them from getting well. But some of them had resistant bugs, and some of them had a few things that we could you know, make a difference about. So. We put into the protocol, it's absolutely essential to drink water, this amount, two, two ounces every 15 minutes all day long if you want to get well from Lyme disease. And you need to modify the program uh, so that you know the other resistant bugs can be taken care of. So we did that, and he, he, he put another 100 patients on that and found that that worked in 80% of the cases. So it does, still doesn't work in 100%, but it works in you know a large percentage of patients empirically. If the if the if the patient can find an energetic practitioner to to fine tune the program for that particular patient's specific needs, then you can get up to about ninety percent. Wow! So, is there a particular uh, herbal substance that we should know about that the people that are have been suffering from long term or long time Lyme's disease need to add to their repertoire? Well, yeah. What what most people are looking for is a single magic bullet, but uh, yeah, that's exist. right. <laughs> it doesn't exist when it comes to Lyme disease. So, uh, so what what the uh, uh, what, what I did is I put uh, the information about uh, Lyme disease on an Ecuadorian website because they still have freedom of speech down there, and so the people you know, listening can go to uh, Nutramedics.ec website and see what the uh, you know, what the Ecuadorians recommend, you know, for treatment of Lyme disease uh, with a, a, an empiric program. And, you know, if they decide that they want to do that program, then, then they can purchase that program either from there or from a, a U.S. company. But, you know, it's a, uh, it, it's, it's not a, a 50-yard dash. It's a marathon for sure. I don't think I've ever seen anybody get rid of chronic Lyme disease in less than four months. It's usually a six to 12-month uh, process. My goodness. It's one of those herbs, cat's claw by chance. Well, yes, cat's claw is helpful. Uh, the cat's claw that I usually recommend is a, uh, is a pentacyclic oxazole alkaloid chemotype of, uh, of cat's claw, which uh, isn't found very often in nature. Uh, so that, that particular one seems to have a more uh, uh, anti, better antimicrobial effects and also a more immune adaptogenic property. So if, the, if part of the immune system is down, it'll bring that part up. If part of the immune system is overactive, causing autoimmunity, it'll bring that part down. So, so that, uh, that the, you know, one, one of the pieces, that was one of, the, one of the early pieces that we put into the program, but it has, uh, I think, 12, no, 14 different components now, or 16 different components. So it's, it's a, a lot more than that. You know, most people that have Lyme disease are magnesium deficient, vitamin C deficient. Uh, most of them have uh, a variety of toxins that need to be cleared out of the body. And, you know, the cat's claw is not going to remove the toxins. It only kills more critters and makes more toxins. So you got to deal with all that stuff. So it's not a one-two punch, so, so to speak. And it's, 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 it's a longer-term process. And it's a lifestyle change, isn't it? Yeah, you have to have a lifestyle change. You have to you know, say, okay, I'm going to do this. But most people start seeing a little daylight within a couple of months of starting the program. And once you see some daylight, you say, oh, I haven't seen daylight with anything else I've done for the last several years. So I think I'm going to continue this. So then they do. And you know, by the fourth month, they usually see a lot more daylight. And by the sixth month, a whole lot more still. And so, so they just persist until they have no more symptoms, and then they change the program to where they're only taking the antimicrobial herbals about once a day. And if they still remain well, then they know that they've probably gotten rid of the bugs, and they can just remain on the, you know, the magnesium and the, the, the detoxification agents, and they can leave off the antimicrobial agents and see how they do. 
So last but not least, and then we're going to move ahead into energy medicine, but all this is so fascinating to so many of my listeners. I'm interested in knowing what your perspective is on the top alternative cancer therapies. You know, my husband is a four-stage melanoma survivor. He used used mega doses of vitamin C. He used, um, oh, the thing that he shot himself with. Um, It's used by anthroposophic medicine. I can't recall the name of it. It was supposed to connect the heart with the soul, the, the, the soul with the mind, because his apparently were, were divided when his mother died. Um, mm-hmm. I'll think of that in a minute. And then, of course, the macrobiotic diet. So my question to you is, do you think that there's one program that works for everybody? Does everybody have to be vegan? Do they have to be um, necessarily gluten or dairy free? Or there's some general broad strokes you could apply to anybody that has cancer? Uh, no, one size does not fit all, that's for sure. Uh, we're all too biochemically individual. Uh, Dr. Roger Williams at the University of Texas in Austin figured that out back in the early 60s. And they found that if you put, uh, if you put 20 people into a room and measure the amount of any one nutrient that they all needed for health, you would find a seven-fold difference between the highest nutrient need and the lowest nutrient need for uh, just, that 20, just those 20 people. If you put 100 people in the room, it was a it was a 12-fold difference. So you know we're we're all too biochemically individual to just do a you know one size fits all type of program. I can tell you this from experience that sugar always feeds cancer. I can tell you this also that excessive amounts of of uh, amino acids or animal source protein usually worsens cancer. And it's not that you can't have some, but you can't. You should not have excess because the excess of amino acids can stimulate the mTOR pathway, which then can stimulate cancer growth. So you have to Good try point. to find out the, the sweet spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to find the right the right amount for, of each of the nutrients for you for your own individual metabolisms. Back in the 2013-14, I was looking at a bunch of the books on the health food store shelf. Uh, about diet, and almost all of them said the same thing. This diet works for everybody, and that's a lie. And I said, that's that's criminal that uh, that that each one of those books say that when it's not true. Correct. So so I decided to write a book called Foods That Fit a Unique You that tells people how to figure out probably pretty well what the right diet is for them, not not just any old diet, but how to figure out by some uh, objective testing and some uh, questionnaires and so on. What, uh, what is the right diet for you? And so that's a good place to start when you're talking about cancer treatment is try to get, figure out what, what diet you should be on. The second step is usually to, is the detoxification. It's the detoxification not only for the heavy metals and the, the pesticides, herbicides, solvents, and so on, but also detoxification from the emotions. I've never seen a patient with advanced cancer who didn't have a significant boatload of emotions contributing yes. to the cancer. Yes, good point. Yeah, and so, so for that, you know, we can use, uh, you know, soul wound prayer work, or you can use uh, uh, emotion code, or you can use recall healing, or you can use Evox therapy, but something that works fast. You, you don't want to pick standard psychotherapy because that's too slow. The patient will be dead and gone before you finally even get enough of the emotions resolved that way. So again, it's, it's a big change from the body, mind, and spirit, a complete lifestyle shift and change. And you don't just adapt this when you have the cancer, but when you're in remission, it should be continued, wouldn't you suggest? Yeah, yeah. You don't necessarily have to be as aggressive with the treatment uh, once the cancer is in remission as you were when the cancer was uh, you know, there full force. Uh, but you still need to you know, have, have a maintenance program. You don't go back to eating gobs of sugar. You don't go back to trying to, uh, you know, have uh, bad relationships that create more negative emotions. You try to learn from your past experiences and pick more, more carefully the people that you're going to associate with in the future so you don't uh, scrape so many scabs off of your old emotional wounds. So are there, is there any type of emotion that's most prevalent among these cancer uh, sufferers? Uh, ang- yeah, ang- anger is present in all of them. Anger. And sometimes it's not outwardly directed. Sometimes it's inwardly directed. I'm so angry at myself because fill in the blank. And if you if you don't resolve that emotion, you can't get rid of cancer. In my experience, permanently, you you, you can get you can reduce it, but you can't get rid of it. Huh. And so so uh, another word for anger, inwardly directed, is guilt. Okay. 
So guilt is a very destructive emotion. And uh, our, hourly directed anger is also a very destructive emotion. Uh, you know, we, we say, well, that person hurt me so badly I can never forgive them. Well, uh, by holding on to the anger toward them, are you hurting them? No, you're hurting yourself, right? So when you decide to stop hurting yourself, then you make a choice to forgive them. <laughs> uh, well, you've given us quite a lot of food for thought, and I still need to get to energy medicine, which I think is the frontier of of the new of the new uh, horizon in medicine. So you've been using energy medicine for many years. How would you explain that to the lay person? What is energy medicine? Well, okay, so. Um, if you go to an allopathic doctor and they say, we need to do an electrocardiogram, uh, they do that. And they just did an energy medicine test. It's now an accepted energy medicine test, but nonetheless, an energy medicine test. If they do an electroencephalogram, same thing, EEG. If they do a, a nerve conduction velocity, same thing. If they do a, uh, a myogram, same thing. Uh, you know, if they, if they treat you with a TENS unit, like you see the football players wearing out on the football field, uh, the wires hanging out of the jerseys, <laughs> so that, that's an energy medicine treatment. You know, but, it, but those energy medicine treatments have migrated over into, you know, into conventional medicine. Magnetic resonance imaging is an energy medicine uh, evaluation. And, uh, you know, when, you know, when the MR scanners first came out, all of them were functional MRI scanners. So you could tell not only the an anatomy of what was going on, but also the function of what was going on in the tissues. But the radiologist said, oh, too much information. It's confusing us. You know, get rid of that. So they went back to the drawing board and got rid of all of the functional information on the MRI scanners and brought them back to basically a, a, an anatomical testing device using magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy. So... Uh, after some years, a, uh, a, a neurosurgeon was in the MRI department, seeing a, pa you know, seeing a patient get, go through a scan, and he knew something about uh, magnetic resonance and spectroscopy, and he asked the technician from the company who was there, why, why don't they uh, have a, a device that would you know, look at the function of the tissues? God, no, it's possible. And the technician happened to be one that was there when they took the original functional MRI scan out of the, out of the department, he said, well, we, we can. Uh, we, you, you know, your, your hospital has one of those in storage somewhere. You know, he said, well, I want that back. He said, well, I can't make the, the technician said, I can't make that happen, but you can talk to your administrator and see if you can make it happen. So he went to the administrator and said, I insist, if you want to keep me here on the staff, that you get the functional MRI scanner out of, out of storage and put it back into the department so I can use it. So he did a bunch of research on, on brain stuff and, and spinal cord stuff. Uh, with a functional MRI scanner, and all the all the other doc and, and published that in the literature, and all the other doctors in the country wanted to start doing that because they wanted to keep up with the Joneses. Sure. But to this, but to this day, to this day, they still won't do a functional MRI scan on any part of the body except the brain or the spine. And so it's just really frustrating, you know, that that we have you know ability to do a whole lot more than we're doing, but because you know certain doctors uh, believe certain things, then they won't allow change. So one, one famous uh, elderly doctor that was in teachings uh, toward the end of his life said, uh, you know, change in medicine occurs one death at a time. And he was not referring just to the death of the patients. He was referring to the death of the old teachers in the university. Oh. <laughs> yeah. so, so anyway, that, that, that's energy medicine, allopathic medicine. But we have all kinds of energy medicine and integrative medicine that they choose not to look at. And there's, there's, there's a good reason why they choose not to look at it, because with, with, with you know, uh, electrodermal screening, with uh, skilled kinesiology, you can actually determine which drug is beneficial for a patient and which drug is harmful for a patient. And unfortunately, most drugs are harmful for the patient. And most of the education that's done in U.S. universities across the country is paid for by grants from pharmaceutical companies. So they don't want that, that energy medicine testing to, to ever be part of the curriculum in the, in, in the program. They don't want doctors using that. They don't want doctors, uh, you know, seeing that the pharmaceuticals are usually not a good idea. So what have you found to be the most successful new energy medicine treatments? Do you use sounds and light and color, for example? All of those, all of the above. You know, the, uh, uh, each one has its place, and so that's part of the art of, of integrative medicine is figuring out you know, which patient would benefit most from which of those possibilities. 
you know, allopathic medicine has about three tools in their toolbox. They have a group of pharmaceuticals as one tool. They have a group of surgeries as another tool, and they have radiation therapy as another tool. And they have just a, maybe two or three others that they are now dabbling with. But, you know, in integrative medicine, we have hundreds of tools, and a, a skilled integrative doctor can figure out what is the best tool for that patient, not trying to, you know, figure out, you know, what of the tools, the limited tools that you have in allopathic toolbox would, could possibly help the patient, but what is the best tool for that patient? And, you know, for, you know, if, if you, if, for example, if you have a, a microbial infection and you can't tolerate a chemical ingestion, either an herb or a pharmaceutical to get rid of it, then a, a frequency therapy often can get rid of that infection. You know, so, you know, Dr. Dr. Raymond Royal Rife was the one that, that proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt back in the 1920s. Uh, he had he, he built a very high-powered light microscope that could uh, amplify things under the microscope at the same level as present-day uh, electron micrographs. Now, the problem with the electron microscope is that you have to kill whatever's going to go under the scope before you can actually visualize it. So you can't see any live creatures. But Dr. Rife had a, li a light microscope where you could see live viruses moving on the scope, and, uh, and they could tell which... Uh, frequencies had an effect on those because the, the, the microbes had a, a violaceous color and they were moving <clears throat> until you put the right frequency into the air of the room from a uh, from a frequency tube generator and when you when you finally hit the right frequency then that microbe would turn would stop moving and would turn uh, dark black gray and uh, so he called that frequency that was necessary to stop the, the life of that microbe the mortal oscillatory rate for the microbe. So Dr. Reif you know, got from a, uh, a, a hospital in San Diego a, a tumor, a breast tumor from a breast cancer patient, and he, uh, he, he homogenized it with a blender, and he, he pushed the liquid from that homogenized breast cancer through a micropore filter that would not allow bacteria, funguses, or larger microbes to go through, but would allow virus particles and, and something smaller to go through. So he got the liquid that went through the micropore filter and cultured it on a culture media, and it grew large funguses. So he proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the, cancer, the, the microbe that causes breast cancer is a pleomorphic microbe. It changes from tiny viral size, viral size to large fungal size uh, in, in the right environment in a few hours' time. And he, he then used his, his uh, microscope to determine what mortal oscillatory rate was necessary for that microbe. And once he determined that, he asked the hospital if they had any women with breast cancer that, that wanted to go through a non-invasive treatment up at, uh, at his clinic to see if he could help them out. So the hospital sent him 16 women that had breast cancer, and over the next three months, they all became free of, of breast cancer just by using the frequency broadcasting into the room. Hmm. And th this was the beginning of the end for Dr. Rife. Up to that point, he was, uh, you know, very well uh, liked and, and supported by all the doctors in the all the you know main doctors in the country from the big universities. But but after that, uh, he became persona non grata. The uh, the American Medical Association uh, head approached him to to buy his technology. He wouldn't re he wouldn't sell it. So they they vandalized his lab. Then they burned his lab to the ground. And they bought legal action against him for practicing medicine without a license and basically wrecked his life. So that was his thing. Oh, that's, that's modern medicine for you. But do we still have the Rife technology available today in other forms? Yeah, yeah, there's different versions of that uh, that, uh, that can still be used today. And, you know, you can't make any claims about it. Otherwise, your equipment will come be confiscated. But, uh, but you can uh, use equipment like that uh, on a self experimentation basis the government can't stop you from experimenting on yourself yet so that's a yet i know yes. the, the the yet the yet yep. there so, so what could the average person do utilizing color light or sound therapy do you have any little tidbits or little easy ways to incorporate yeah yeah that? I, I i have a favorite one for for sound therapy uh and i just ran across this about six months ago or a year ago uh it's called, uh, the, the website's called call, calmingharp.com, C-A-L-M-I-N-G-H-A-R-P.com. And the fellow that's on, that, that, that put this website together uh, was inspired to build a harp 
which he had never done before, but he learned how to do it, and he built, built a harp. And then he felt like he got a word from God to, to tune it to specific frequencies. You know, you, you, it's, a, it's a stringed instrument, so you can you know, tune it sharper or tune it more flat uh, to, you know, for each, each note, depending on what you want. And so uh, he tuned it uh, to the frequencies that he found embedded in the book of Numbers in the Bible. And so those are those are those are called the, the healing frequencies. And so, for example, the frequency 528 is the most powerful healing frequency of all what, frequencies. What is the num- What is that number again? 528. So it it is it is called the frequency of love. Okay, yes. the most powerful healing force in the universe is love, and the most powerful healing frequency in the universe is the frequency of love. So, so anyway, he wrote a whole bunch of different harp sound, songs using that, that basic uh, 528 frequency, and they are powerfully healing, in my experience, without doing anything else. Oh, I love that. That's going to be so helpful to our listeners. And yeah. isn't, isn't that the DNA restorative frequency? I, it seems yeah, to yeah. me. Yeah, it yeah. It does lots of things in the body, but uh, it you know, helps, to, helps to elongate the telomeres probably. It does definitely improves the, uh, the healing of the DNA that gets damaged from, from daily uh, insults. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's a regenerative frequency. Interesting. But, uh, yeah, but the, re- the rest of the frequencies that, that are part of that were, were frequencies found in the Bible in, 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 the, uh, in the book of Numbers. I think it's where he found it. But he's got a story about all that on his website. And I, I find it just uh, fascinating information. He's written, he, he figured out also that, that you know, the, the book of Psalms was written originally as songs, S-O-N-G-S. And uh, he, he figured out that the, the notes that were, that were used to be, to, to, that were intended to be played with each one of those psalms is actually embedded in the Hebrew text of each psalm. So he's written the, the, the music for each psalm. Oh, how Fasc- beautiful. Fasc- fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. This reminds me of that Salvaggio, the, the ancient scale that has disappeared yeah. from our, yeah, so it's all t- connected. Very yeah. interesting. I know Leonard Horowitz wrote about some of that for many years. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think he got, I think uh, this fellow, uh, Steve Reese, got some ideas from Horowitz's book. He got some ideas from reading the Bible. He got some re- ideas from various sources, but what he's come up with is just uh, incredible. Yeah. I've got to check that out. I, I love that. What about, um, the use of EMFs, healthy EMFs, in terms of healing. Well, yeah. So, so you can use uh, you can you can test with electromagnetic devices. That's called electrical screening, or you can treat with electromagnetic devices. Uh, so, so, there's a variety of those on the market. You know, as I said, the first one that's already been accepted into the allopathic medical community is the uh, TENS unit, uh, trans transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulator, but. So we have all kinds of specific frequency devices that uh, that can give you amazing results. Uh, for example, the, the frequency-specific microcurrent device. Uh, you know, d- uh, d- Dr. McMakin has done more research on that and, and teaching of that than, than anybody else that I know of in this country. And uh, so she has courses that you can learn how to use uh, uh, what we call du- dual-channel uh, frequency delivery and get some quite remarkable results just with frequencies uh, delivered into the body. No, no chemicals, no, no, uh, you know, other therapies that, uh, that were, they're typically used in this country, but just frequencies and frequencies alone. Yeah, so you know, I, I also, also developed a, a software for, for one of the electrothermal screening devices. So, so the electrothermal screening device can measure which frequencies are best for a particular patient. So you don't have to guess. You can actually interject the test to see which ones are the right frequencies. Then you program those into a frequency generating device, and you can get amazing, uh, you know, benefit to the health from that. And what is the name of that device? Is it the Zido method? I did put the uh, the testing process into the Zido. I don't have any ownership in Zido, but uh, not even any stock. But, um, but but I do think it's a useful uh, tool for energy medicine for. Uh, uh, inter- integrative medicine, uh, and there's, there's you know fancier devices out there and a lot more expensive devices out there, but you don't have to have the most expensive device to get good results. You know, Dr. McMakin's device is, is not ghastly expensive like some other devices are, but but it works well. 
Yes, I've been using that. I think it's very, very helpful. And I'm curious about one thing as we kind of close out our wonderful episode with you. You obviously were a conventionally trained cardiologist and internist, if I'm not mistaken. Right. What was the turning point that made you so imbued and so fascinated with alternative and integrative health? Yep, that happened in my first month of medical school. I, up to that point in my life, I'd only lived in... Uh, Hold on, Sam. Turn, I turn that off. Uh, I, I lived in arid West Texas, and uh, I was not used to mold, and uh, I was not used to humidity. Uh, that I moved to Houston for uh, medical school. So when I got down there, I uh, was experiencing the, the you know the grass and the weeds and the trees and the mold and the fungus and everything else in the air, and I developed initially allergic rhinitis, then allergic sinusitis, then uh, infected sinusitis, then bronchitis, and finally pneumonia. And all this time that I was having these illnesses, I was going to the chairman of different medical school department heads. I went to, you know, the ear, nose, oh, sorry, the allergy and immunology first, and then the ear, nose, and throat next, and then the pulmonary department next. And I followed their advice and took the drugs that they recommended and got progressively worse. But thank goodness my wife's grandmother came to visit us uh, she was a school teacher and self-taught nutritionist. She was not a doctor. And uh, she saw how much I was suffering and struggling. And so she had pity on me. And she took me to the health food store and got me on some vitamins, <laughs> minerals, and herbs. And I got well in about a month's time. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I need to learn what this woman knows. And I need to take with a grain of salt everything I learned in the training institution after this. So, so in medical school, when I had extra time to read, I didn't read medical textbooks. I read you know, books on nutrition and books on East, Western herbs and books on Eastern herbs and books on fixed magnetic therapies and books on pulse magnetic therapies and so on. So by the time I finished my formal training in 1984, that was, uh, let's see, I guess I was doing that for six years, you know, between the medical school and the, and the residency, in and fellowships, uh, no, it's longer than that. Yeah, 75 through 84, so nine years. I was I was stu studying and practicing on myself and my family and my immediate friends. So after nine years, I was pretty skilled at integrative medicine, but I had not come out of the closet yet because that was not popular at all at that time. You know, you could uh, get a lot of chastisement, sometimes even get your license removed if uh, you know your medical license removed if you uh, were were doing integrative and alternative medicine. But uh, I practiced uh, conventional and basic cardiology and critical care medicine for one year after I finished the formal training, and I was completely miserable. I, I saw that I was able to help patients that most, most, most other doctors couldn't help because I was cheating. I was using some of the things I'd learned in, 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 in alternative medicine uh, for those uh, inpatients at the hospital. But, you know, what I saw is that none of them would change their lifestyle. They would all come back after two or three months with the same condition that they had when they were in the hospital. And I was getting really discouraged. And I was getting worn out, too, because that was a grueling lifestyle. So at the end of the year, I decided I couldn't do that anymore. And I, uh, I went into you know, preventive medicine, preventive cardiology, uh, integrative medicine, and, in and integrative cardiology. And, uh, and I really enjoyed that. I, I, I took a huge pay cut to do that, but, you know, it's not all about the money. You got to do what you feel like, uh, you know, the creator has called you on the earth to do and, and don't get focused on the money. If you, if you do the right thing, then, you know, the, there'll be enough money to live on. You don't have to worry about the money as long as you're doing what the, what the creator calls you to do. So I did that, you know, for lots of years and, uh, you know, really, really enjoyed helping patients that were sent home to die by the other doctors. Well, that's quite a story. And I think to conclude, you need to tell us a little bit about the academy that you created and what that's all about and how people can access it. That's the Comprehensive Integrative Medicine Academy, if I'm not mistaken, or the, Acad course. the Academy of Comprehensive Integrative Medicine. There you did it. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. When we uh, first started the academy back in 2008, we looked to see what other groups out there were doing teaching integrative medicine. And we found that uh, a few university uh, hospitals across the country were already starting to teach integrative medicine. But then we looked really carefully at each department and each department was one or two practitioners doing two to four modalities in integrative medicine and calling that a, an integrative medicine department. 
which was a joke because you know, I already had hundreds of things that I was doing by that time uh, uh, successfully, effectively in patients. And I thought, well, we can't just call ourselves, you know, Academy of, of Integrative Medicine. It has to have another word. So we decided to add the word comprehensive. And so it's Academy of Comprehensive Integrative Medicine, ACIM Connect. And we had to add the, uh, the connect on the end of it because if you just type in ACIM, you usually get a, a course in miracles, and that's not us. No. <laughs> okay. But the ACIM Connect. Now, the, the, the connect is saying, uh, t- t- you know, helping people understand that we connect uh, doctors to doctors so that, you know, doctors that are learning can learn from doctors that already know something. We connect doctors to patients so that the patients can get some help from the doctors that, uh, that, that they, that are in our, in our group that they, you know, when they haven't been able to get help from doctors outside of our group and we're connecting patients to patients. So patients then can, you know, uh, communicate with each other. Uh, at least that's been the vision to, to try to get all that fully functional on the website. So there could be a, uh, you know, a, a forum for, for the public to go in there and, and, and communicate with each other. And I know that both James and I had the pleasure of speaking at one of your uh, annual meetings. Do you still present in Orlando in, I think it was November? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we did one in this last November, and it was on our favorite integrative tools. And uh, it was, uh, I think it was a great conference. So we had a few uh, new doctors that had never been to our conferences before, and they said, my goodness, I wish I'd known about this a few years ago. <laughs> uh, so the, the they, word is spreading. Yeah, because they they learn so much, but uh, you know we uh, we hope to make a difference uh, in the lives of the doctors that we interact with and in the lives of the patients that we interact with. Uh, that's about the most that we can hope for is to try to, to try to make a positive difference in those lives. Yeah, so so lovely. And on that note, I'm going to thank you so much, Doctor Lee Cowden, the doctor's doctor, for being my guest today on the First Lady of Nutrition podcast, and I'm hopeful that you'll come back again and join us. Do you promise that you will? I'll be back. Uh, Thank you so much for having me on your show today, Anne Louise. My pleasure. Be well, stay well, sei gesund. Stay well, sei gesund. Stay well, sei gesund. Stay well, sei gesund. Stay well, sei gesund.